today uh, we have another block of two hours, and again I'll take a break about halfway through so that um, you can catch your breath. Um, what we're going to do is follow on the lectures I gave last time, which introduced you to um, the concept of DNA sequencing, talked a bit about why sequencing is useful and what you can do with sequence data, and in particular looked at these two methods of doing sequencing. So we talked about Sanger sequencing, that's sometimes called classic um, or first generation sequencing, and we talked about Illumina sequencing, which is often referred to as um, a next generation or a next gen method. Um, there are lots of next gen methods. Any, any of the high throughput methods that generate large amounts of sequence data fairly rapidly are kind of collectively referred to um, as, as next gen. Um, so I'm not going to talk a great deal more about the actual sequencing methods today. We've, we've covered those. Uh, what we're going to look at is things like how you analyse the data. Um, and we'll look at uh, some examples, some applications. I'm going to say a little bit about uh, a new method um, called nanopore sequencing that I know some of you uh, have some familiarity with. And then, having said a lot about DNA sequencing, we'll also talk about how you can use Illumina sequencing to look at transcription and sort of look at translation as well. So not just look at um, genome sequences, but also look at messenger RNA uh, and also what goes on um, at the ribosome. So that's what we're going to cover. And as I said, I'll take a break about halfway, um, five or ten minutes or so, so that you can uh, get your brains back in gear and, and catch up with your notes and so on. So what I want to start off with is saying a little bit more about how um, you would analyse sequence data coming off an Illumina. So to remind you very, very quickly about how Illumina sequencing will work, what you would see, or actually what the, um, the, the camera would see, you don't see this, but this is seen by a light collecting camera, um, is a series of clusters, uh, many, many millions of these, um, each one flashing a different colour with each step of the sequencing reaction, and each colour corresponding to one of the four bases. So if this was a, a, a video, you'd see those dots sitting in the same place, but flashing different colours as the sequence was compiled. And typically from an Illumina run, you might get around about 200 bases of sequence. It varies a bit depending on the machine and the, the protocol, but that's a fairly average length for an Illumina run. So at the end of that, you get a chunk of sequence like this, multiplied by hundreds of millions. So actually, you've got hundreds of millions of chunks of sequence, not all the same as this, of course, all different, um, each one representing a different frag, a uh, different fragment that was tagged to the um, flow cell. So what do you do with this? Or more to the point, what does the computer do with this? Because most of the analysis that takes place is a computational analysis. Um, first of all, what comes off the flow cell is not sequence. What comes off the flow cell is uh, a, a collected a series of images. Those have to be turned into readable sequence, and that's very simple. It's a simple correspondence between each colour and each base. One of the things that you can do, and has to be sorted out at this point, is that because the individual sequencing runs are fairly expensive and take quite a lot of time to do, it's often the case that we'll load several sequencing runs simultaneously onto the same flow cell. And then you think, well, that's no good, because you're going to get, if you're doing eight different genomes, you've got eight different genomes, how are you going to know which bit of DNA belongs to which genome. And the answer to that goes right back to the process of making the library to begin with. If you remember back in the um, second lecture, I think, I talked about how you construct a library for attachment to the flow cell. And the very first step is to, to attach oligonucleotide primers to the two ends of your fragments. And you control the sequence of those primers. You determine what the sequence of those primers is. And one of the things you can do is put a unique sequence in there, which... Um, is called a barcode, and you can make that different for each library that you prepare. So all of your sequences will now contain that barcode, and if you've got eight different libraries on the same flow cell, all you ought to do is sort all the sequences by the presence of that barcode. So all the ones with barcode 1 belong to the first genome, all the ones with barcode 2 belong to the second genome, and so forth. Um, and this is referred to as demultiplexing. So multiplexing is mixing lots of genomes, lots of different libraries together, sequencing them at the same time. Demultiplexing is when you've got the sequence information and you pull it apart by using the barcode to determine which of those different genomes each of the fragments came from. 
So uh, that's very useful because it means that rather than um, doing a single uh, run on each flow cell, you can, you can typically fit eight to ten genomes on. That gives you eight to ten um, as much times information, uh, and it makes the whole process even quicker. And then there's a whole series of steps that take place to make sure the sequence is in good quality. Illumina reads don't always work. Sometimes there's, there's a problem with the library prep. Sometimes there's issues with the reagents. Um, it's very frustrating because it takes a couple of days for a, a good Illumina run to discover at the end of it that there's a problem with the quality of your data. Um, but it can happen. So you check how many reads have you got. Is it a reasonable sort of number? Um, are the sequence reads around about the right sort of length? Are they non-ambiguous? So has the, um, both the hardware and the software successfully identified unique bases at each position? And you can also often check the sequencing error rate. So what you'll often do is um, add to the flow cell some DNA sequence where you know what the sequence is. And then you can check the output of the flow cell against the known sequence and make sure the error rate is acceptable. And for Illumina, you're usually talking about 1% to 0.1% error rate. It's not a perfect um, system. We'll see why that's not a problem in just a moment. Um, but by comparing with your, your known standard, you can just determine is that error rate acceptable or not. And these quality control steps are actually quite important because there's no point in trying to interpret poor sequence data. If it really hasn't worked, you've just got to chuck it out, try and figure out what went wrong uh, and start all over again and find some more money. Having done all of that, so now you've got your demultiplex sequences, you're satisfied that the quality is good, there are two things that you might now do. And the two things that you might do depends on whether you're um, starting with a completely new sequence or whether you're comparing your sequence to a known sequence. So let's assume the first case. We're starting off with an organism uh, or a genome that we've not sequenced before. So we're doing what we'd call de novo assembly, assembly from scratch. And this process is pretty much the same as the one that we did last time when I put up those bits of the sentence and got you to put them back into a proper sentence, um, except it's done computationally. And what the computer is going to do is look for overlaps between all these different sequences, look for regions where the sequences appear to line up. Um, and it assembles these, and when you've got a stretch of sequences um, which overlap with each other, and you've defined the stretch of sequence. It's called a contig, uh, which is short for contiguous sequence. So you've got a, a stretch of DNA, which might be um, hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of bases long, where you're really convinced that you've got the order of the sequence correct. So here's a very, very diagrammatic example. So imagine these are sequence reads. Now, obviously, the true sequence reads are much longer than this, but just to illustrate... Um, here's a bunch of random sequence reads. Just looking at that, if you wanted to, you could line them up. It would take you quite a while because you've only got four bases, um, four bits of information for each position. Um, so I've done it for you. So actually, that's exactly the same sequences. And I've now lined them up, and you can see um, that these uh, five line up and the other six line up with each other. They're, they're not identical because, remember, these are random fragments, but they will align because they represent random fragments of the same original molecules. So we can derive two contigs from this. We've got one here, and we're just, just doing this by um, reading all the bases off at every position. Uh, in some cases, we've got, you know, here we've got that G um, sequenced three times, that A has been sequenced three times, that A has only been sequenced twice, that GTC has only been sequenced once. Same sort of thing here. So here we've got a C, which has actually been sequenced five times. And we refer to this as the read depth. So when you're talking about the read depth, you mean how many times has each base been sequenced? And typically for a good Illumina run, you might be talking about 30 times. So you're generating very large amounts of sequence information. Each base is represented um, roughly 30 times. So this is diagrammatic. The, the depth in a real read would be much greater than this. The length would be much greater. But just to give you an idea about how the system works, um, that should help. So we've got two contigs here. Now, the problem is, how do we join these contigs together? How do we know how all these different contigs come together to form um, larger stretches of DNA? Because there's no overlap between this contig and this contig, so we have no idea if they're close to each other on the genome or distant from each other 
on the genome. And until we find some overlapping sequence, we can't do that. So I'm going to get back to that point later on and explain a bit about um, why it's a problem um, and what we can do about it. This problem of linking the contigs and ultimately the scaffolds together is, is called gap closure. And I think I mentioned this before, a complete genome has got no gaps in it. We know starting at position number one, right the way around to position 5 million or 50 million or 500 million, we know every single base and the order in which that base occurs. Now, generally speaking, when people are talking about a complete genome, they don't really mean that. There are often gaps in complete genome sequences um, which we can live with. Uh, there may be stretches of repetitive DNA where we don't know how many repeats they are um, or something like that. Uh, but sometimes we actually completely want, we want to close the genome completely. That's a lot more work, um, and I'm not going to talk about all the methods that can be used for doing it. But generally speaking, we can get 99% you know, of the information without closing all the gaps, and that's sufficient for most of our purposes. What makes life much easier is if we already know the genome sequence of the organism that we're studying. So if we've already got a complete genome, or a genome of an organism that's very closely related, and we don't have to look for overlaps between all the sequences, we just have to look for where our sequences align with that genome. And we call this a reference genome. So a reference genome means that you've already got a pretty good idea what your sequences are going to look like, and you use that genome, a reference genome, in order to look for matches with the sequence information that comes from the Illumina um, process. Now, you might think, well, why, why would you want to do that? If you already know what the genome sequence is, why, why do you want to resequence it? Um, and the answer is you might be looking, for, for example, for mutations. You might have um, uh, typically something like... Um, you're looking at human genomes, for example. Not everyone is identical, clearly. Uh, so although we know pretty much what the human genome looks like, uh, your genome and genomes of everybody in this room and my genome are different. So we could take a sequence read from any one of you, align it to a known human genome, and map the positions that were different with, with the other human genome. It might be something much simpler than that. It might be a bacterial strain that we've got in the lab um, that we know has picked up a few mutations, we want to very quickly map those mutations, and actually pretty much the quickest way of doing it is just to resequence the entire genome and align the reads against the reference genome for that organism. And then look and see where um, there are differences between the reference genome and um, the genome we're looking at. We may, some of these may just be point mutations. These are quite easy to pick up using Illumina sequencing. Um, we may also have things like um, deletions or ha may have insertions where um, a piece of DNA has moved from elsewhere in the genome. We might have inversions. And actually, these are not so easy to pick up with Illumina sequencing. There can be issues um, sometimes with Illumina sequencing looking for these sorts of things. Um, and you need a, a deeper level of analysis, which I'm not going to go into, um, to detect all of those. There are ways of detecting them, um, but it can be quite tricky. And that's an important point that I'll get back to um, later on today. Okay, so having a reference genome makes life much simpler. All we've got to do is take our sequence files, map them onto the reference genome, and then look for variations between them. And that's relatively straightforward. This is the kind of um, output that you get from this. So this is uh, just a screen grab from one of several different viewers that you can, you can get to look at sequence data. Um, so at the top here, you've, you've got the actual um, DNA sequence. This is zoomed right in just to one part of one gene. You could zoom right out to the whole genome if you wanted to. Um, and these are colour-coded, so the A's are green, the T's are red, um, and so on. You've got both strands marked there. This next um, part of the display in blue is a, um, a map of the coverage or a map of the depth. And I don't know how well you can read that, uh, but this scale goes up to 40 so you can see we're, looking, we're running to around about 20 to 25-fold coverage. Some regions are less well covered. Um, some regions are very well covered. So that's just kind of random chance. just depends on how many of each different fragment you pick up when you do your sequencing. And then below that, we've got all the individual sequence reads in, in this region. So uh, these blue and um, kind of reddish arrows represent individual stretches of sequence which have been read off the Illumina. 
And uh, if they're blue, they're off the bottom strand. If they're red, they're off the top strand. So obviously with the Illumina, we're sequencing both strands simultaneously. And what you can see, um, first of all, is that there are, uh, every position on here is covered by at least several of those sequences. So even where the coverage gets pretty low, which is here, if you take that position, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and nine different sequence reads that all contain that region. So we can be very confident that in that region that sequence is correct. Uh, and then there's other regions like here, for example, I'm not going to count them, but there's probably, there's well over 20 different um, bits of sequence that all contain that region. So we're really sure that's right. Now, one of the things that you'll notice on this um, is that there are little colored bits um, on these different reads. And these represent positions in the individual reads that don't match with the reference genome. So if we take this position uh, here, for example, you can see on that read, there's a T at that position. Uh, on all the other reads, I can't actually go, I think it's probably either a G, it should be a G or a C. Now, what does that mean? It probably means that there's an, an inaccuracy in that read. So remember I said the accuracy is around about 0.1 to 1%. So that means if, you have, if it's an inaccuracy of, say, 1%, and you've got a 200 base pair read, a couple of those bases are going to be wrong. So the Illumina method is not perfect. It's not as accurate yet as the Sanger method. But because you sequence every base multiple times, you can still tell what the base is. So if you, if you get a, a particular base which in 25 cases is a G, and then in one case is a T, you're pretty confident that G is the correct base call for that position. But you might also see some positions, you can see one here, for example, um, where, and in this case, uh, actually what's being spotted is a couple of missing bases, which is why it's shown us with a, a little star there, where around about half of the reads are different from the reference genome. And that makes you think that's probably a mutation. And probably it's a heterozygous mutation, so you're picking up both the wild type and the mutated copy of that mutation. And um, this process of looking at sequence data, looking for positions where um, the reads differ from the wild type to a certain extent, and trying to figure out whether those differences are genuine variants, is a really important part of Illumina sequencing. Particularly, as you'll see an example later on, if you're doing something like, say, comparing um, a tumour genome to a wild-type genome from the same person. You're looking for the very few regions where those two genomes differ. And so you're looking for cases where you'll see a lot of things like this, where in many of the reads, there's a difference from the reference genome. Whereas when it's just one or two odd cases, generally speaking, that's almost certainly because um, it's just a miscall, an error in the sequence. So I hope that's clear, and that just gives you an idea of what looking at Illumina sequence data can look like. Um, you can spend hours and hours gazing at this kind of stuff. It's much simpler to, again, use computational tools to try to pick where the real um, mutations might be. So um, Illumina's wonderful. Uh, we love it. We use it a lot. Um, many people are now doing Illumina sequencing for all sorts of different kinds of projects. But there are problems with it. And first of all, it is tricky to deal with um, large structural variants, big inversions, big deletions, um, and it's tricky to deal with regions of repetitive DNA or regions of sequence that occur multiple times within the genome. Uh, I'm just going to go over that point and say a bit more about um, gap closure and the kind of problems that can arise, because that will lead me into um, a discussion of, of the nanopore approach. The other thing with Illumina is... Um, the assembly process, particularly if you're starting off with a novel genome, is a lot of computational power needed for that. You have very, very large data files, um, and some pretty sophisticated software running for quite a long time is needed to assemble the contigs and the scaffolds. So what's this issue about gaps and, and not being able to cross all the regions? This is a picture I showed you earlier on um, of how you do this kind of sequencing, you, 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 here's your sequence which you start off with, you break it up into random fragments, you look for overlaps, you order the sequences according to those overlaps and that gives you the sequence here. That, that, that's all well and good. The question is though, what happens? Here's an example of the kind of problem you can have. Supposing the same sequence occurs more than one time within the genome. So this is not uncommon. Um, even in bacteria, it's quite common. Uh, you can have insertion sequences which are small 
regions of transposable DNA that can jump around the genome. So you might have four or five copies of those in the bacterial chromosome. In um, human DNA, it's really common. So there's lots of parts of our DNA which are highly duplicated, uh, highly repetitive, um, remains of old retroviruses and all that kind of stuff which are scattered around the genome um, like confetti. So you run into these an awful lot when you do the sequencing. And here's the problem. Let's imagine that um, maybe this is, say, bits of two different chromosomes, uh, and the different colours represent different sequences, and this sequence here, this blue sequence, which has been duplicated, so it's the same on these two different chromosomes, is more than 250 bases long. So we can't get through that with an Illumina sequence read. We can read into one end of it, we can read into the other end of it, but it's too big to read right the way across. Now, the sorts of reads we're going to, to um, generate across the, the junction of that blue sequence, um, here's one here, a bit of this sequence and a bit of the blue, another one here, a bit of blue and a bit of green, and then on the other chromosome, different sequence and, and the blue sequence and a different sequence and the blue sequence. So the blue sequence here and here are the same, and here and here are the same. And the problem, as I'm sure you can see, is that those junction fragments are consistent with different arrangements of the flanking regions. So there's one, which is entirely consistent, and there's another one. Okay, so we're not, we've not got any new junction fragments, but there's no way of telling between these two possibilities on the basis of those short sequence reads. You run into a region of uncertainty, and when you come out of it, you don't know whether you're on the same chromosome or in the corresponding region of uncertainty on a different chromosome. So this is an example of the kind of thing that can cause um, gaps in the, scaffold, in, in the scaffold when we're trying to put contexts together and can lead to uncertainty in figuring out exactly how those genomes are put together. Now, there are ways around this. I'm, I'm not going to describe all of them. I'll just mention um, one fairly briefly, which is called paired end reading, because this is quite widely used in a luminous sequence to try to get around this problem. And um, this is kind of an ingenious thing, because what paired end reading enables you to do is when you do your Illumina sequence, to actually um, sequence both ends of each fragment. And I'll show you what I mean by that, by going back to the diagram that I drew when I was describing how the Illumina sequence works. So if you recall, these represent the individual clusters on the flow cell. And these have been produced by bridge amplification um, with the primers uh, bound to the flow cell hybridizing to the oligonucleotides that we put at the ends of the fragments. Okay? And this is the basis for Illumina sequencing. You've got multiple copies of each sequence at that position. Now, what I said at the point was all these um, clusters could be sequenced by the same primer. Um, the students among you will have realized actually all the clusters can be sequenced by two primers because they've got different sequences at the two ends. And so depending on whether we use a primer that's homologous to uh, the blue or to the green, we're going to generate a sequence at the two ends of those two fragments. Now, those fragments aren't going to move. They're fixed in perpetuity to that flow cell. So we can perfectly well sequence from one end and then wash everything away and then sequence from the other end and look at the same positions. And that means for each fragment, we'll generate a bit of sequence data from down here and a bit of sequence data from up here. And remember, these are fragments which represent a stretch of the chromosome. So we're now learning about two bits of DNA which are connected. They're contiguous on the chromosome. And um, this is called paired end reading because the ends are paired in those clusters. So people will often say, oh, have you done single end reads or have you done paired end reads? Paired end reads take longer. It's more expensive, but you get a lot more information for it. Now... What you hope with paired end reading is that some of these paired end reads will span some of the gaps in the contigs, and that will enable you to build larger scaffolds. So here's a situation. Again, this is completely diagrammatic, but just to give you an idea. So here's um, contig one. This is the same as I showed you before. Here's contig two. Now, we've done a paired end read, and we found a paired end read where one end of the read corresponds to this contig, and then the other end of the read corresponds to this contig. So what we can be pretty confident is actually these two contigs must be adjacent. They must correspond to DNA which is adjacent on the chromosome. Because this, even though we don't have the whole sequence of this fragment, we know that at one end it fits to that, and at one end it fits to that. So we can use 
the pair then reads, and the analysis of the pair then reads, to join the contigs into these larger scaffolds. And it's one of the ways um, that we can close, not the only way, and it's not foolproof, but it's one of the ways that we can close gaps in the genomes. Here's another diagram showing the same thing. So you've got a series of overlapping reads generating contig 1, a series of overlapping reads generating contig 2, and a series of overlapping reads generating contig 3. We're looking to see the physical relationship of those three contigs with each other. In what order do they occur along the chromosome? And we've identified some paired N reads that overlap with contig 1 and 2 and with contig 2 and 3. So we know the order must be 1, then 2, then 3. If the order was 1, 3, 2, then we'd find paired N reads that overlap between contig 1 and contig 3, and then 3 and 2. Okay, so these are linking things that enable us to put different bits of the jigsaw together. So again, same sort of diagram here. Um, and remember, you're not getting, you don't know this sequence still. All you know is the sequences at the ends, but you know that those sequences are on the same fragment. This stuff in the middle might still be a long stretch of repetitive DNA that you don't care about. All you want to know is that the non-repetitive DNA on either side of that is linked on the same chunk of DNA. So um, paired end reading can be very useful to build up a more complete um, assembly of the genome than you can get from single end reads. What else is wrong with Illumina? You know those videos that do you know, 27 things wrong with Lord of the Rings and all that kind of stuff on YouTube? You think of all the things that could be wrong with Illumina. Um, it doesn't deal well with structural variations, so deletions and insertions. Uh, it requires an awful lot of software. It's big and chunky, so a, 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 a MySeq is you know, this sort of size. It's a pretty big piece of kit. Uh, it's expensive. And the runs are quite slow. So until the run has happened, you have no information. And runs can you know, easily be overnight and, and sometimes even longer, depending on tr how much information you're trying to extract. So if you want something that's going to give you really quick information, uh, in diagnosis, for example, for example, Illumina's not always a good way to go because of the length of time it takes for the runs um, to happen. So this is where we come into... Um, something which is really quite remarkable and very new uh, and really under a lot of development. I'm just going to say a little bit about this because um, quite a bit of the work on this is actually being done here at Birmingham and you're going to hear more about that in one of the later lectures in the uh, techniques module. Um, and this is what's called nanopore technology. And nanopore technology is a completely different way of doing sequence DNA. It's totally different from Sanger and Illumina, which in some ways have quite a lot of similarities. Uh, it's utterly different. And it has several huge advantages. Number one, you get extremely long reads. So you can get tens or hundreds of thousands of bases in single reads. So instead of getting two or three hundred at a time, you're getting many thousands at a time. Secondly, I meant to bring one over to show you actually, but secondly, um, the sequencer, rather than being a big chunky piece of equipment that sits on, on a bench, is around about the size, uh, or actually in many cases, um, well, it's about the size of a big USB stick. So this thing down here is a nanopore sequencer. Uh, they come even smaller than that. This is called a min-iron, um, which runs off a laptop. laptop. There's now a thing called a squid iron that will plug into a mobile phone. So, you know, it's, it's smaller than an iPhone. The other thing that's really good about um, nanopore is you get data as soon as you've started the experiment. So within minutes of the data starting, uh, the, the experiment starting, you'll begin to get a readout of what that um, sequence information is. Now, I'm going to describe this to you really briefly um, because you'll hear a lot more about this, uh, I hope, from, from um, Nick Lohman later on. And then I'm going to try and show a couple of video clips if I can get the embedded videos to work that illustrate this from, from YouTube. In essence, the idea about nanopore is this. Um, you have a membrane which has an electric current across it. And embedded in that membrane is a pore, a, a very, very small pore. It's actually a, a protein. You know, it can be all sorts of pores, but um, in the example you're going to see, it's a protein pore. If you pass things through that pore, the current across the membrane changes. It's like the, the potential difference across the membrane changes. And you can measure that change in potential difference using some fairly um, sophisticated electronics. And remarkably... Uh, it's now been found possible to have a way where you can push a DNA molecule through the pore, and as each base passes through the pore, 
you get a change in the potential across the membrane, but the change in the potential is different depending on what the base is. So an A, a T, a G, or a C will produce a different signal. So essentially what you're doing is pushing uh, a long single-stranded stretch of DNA through a pore and recording the change in current as it goes through and then interpreting that as sequence. And you can do this at thousands of bases per second. It can be extremely fast. So I hope these embedded videos will work. We'll have a look and see. So I should say these are produced by the company. So of course they're very kind of glossy and whoa, isn't our technology amazing? This, will, this first video will introduce you to um, the actual nanopore technology just in, in general and then I'll show you one that um, uh, demonstrates how the sequencing works. Oxford Nanopore Technologies is developing nanopore-based sensing technologies for the analysis of DNA, RNA, and proteins. At the heart of the technology is a protein nanopore. This model shows a typical nanopore. The core of the protein is a hollow tube, a few nanometers in diameter. Oxford Nanopore Technologies designs and manufactures bespoke nanopore structures for a range of applications. In nature, Nanopores form holes in membranes. In Oxford Nanopore's technology, the specifically designed nanopore is inserted into a membrane created by a synthetic polymer. This membrane has very high electrical resistance. By applying a potential across the membrane, which is bathed in electrophysiological solution, an ionic current can be generated through the nanopore. Single molecules that enter the nanopore cause characteristic disruptions in the current. This is the nanopore signal. By measuring the disruption, DNA, RNA, or protein molecules can be characterized. The nanopore signal may also be created by larger molecules that pass near the aperture of the nanopore rather than passing through it. Oxford Nanopore Technologies devices operate in real time, allowing a user to run the device until sufficient information is being collected to answer their question. This is facilitated by immediate data analysis from the start of the experiment. Using microchip fabrication techniques, Oxford Nanopore has developed highly scalable arrays of these nanopores to go into devices of any size, from the mobile phone compatible smidge iron to the portable min iron and high throughput Prometh iron. These are designed to provide on-demand biological information for any person in any environment. Okay, so that's the basic idea. The pore in the membrane, the chemical passing through the membrane and measuring the change in the current. Uh, and now we'll take a look at the second video clip which shows specifically how this works with DNA sequencing. For DNA sequencing, intact DNA strands are processed by the nanopores and can be analyzed in real time. The nanopore sequences the fragments that are presented to it regardless of their length, rather than generating reads of a specific length. This could be reads of hundreds of kilobases or more. Nanopore long reads simplify assembly and sequencing of repetitive regions, also improving the speed of species identification in metagenomic experiments. So what happens during nanopore sequencing? The DNA strands to be sequenced are mixed with copies of a processive enzyme, shown here in green. As the DNA enzyme complexes approach the nanopore, the single-stranded DNA is pulled through the aperture. The enzyme ratchets the DNA strand through the nanopore one base at a time. The speed of the enzyme can be controlled. More data is yielded per second the faster the enzyme runs, but with no deterioration in accuracy. As the DNA moves through the pore, the combination of nucleotides in the strand being processed creates a characteristic disruption in the electrical current. This nanopore signal can be used to determine the order of bases on that DNA strand. Nanopores have processed read lengths of hundreds of kilobases, and when a nanopore has processed a complete read, it will start a new one. Nanopores start to stream data as soon as the experiment begins with base calling taking place locally. Users can also take advantage of epitome workflows for real-time analysis, continuing the experiment until sufficient data has been analyzed to determine the answer to a biological question. With nanopore sequencing, the user has the ability to run the experiment until the answer is reached, rather than working to an arbitrary instrument runtime. The workflow described here... So that's a dig at Illumina. Uh, 
<laughs> so what they're saying is, with an Illumina, you've got to switch it on and let it run, and then look at the data at the end of it. With a Nanoport, you don't have to do that. You switch it on, and it immediately starts giving you data. So, for example, you're trying to identify uh, the cause of a, a viral outbreak. Um, you might know that within minutes with a Nanoport because of the speed at which the data comes through. And we'll look at some examples of that later on. There is adaptable and is used to sequence a variety of molecules in okay, real time. We'll, we'll uh, Inclu stop at that point. So um, this is pretty new technology. Um, and as I say, quite a lot of the development work uh, has been done in collaboration with the company, but done um, here at Birmingham. And uh, I'm sure you'll hear some more about that uh, later on in the course. OK, so what I want to do now is switch gears a little bit, move away from methods, um, and talk more about applications and some of the different ways, some of the different uses uh, that all this information, all this uh, huge amount of DNA genome, DNA genome information can be put to. And then we'll go back a little bit and talk about techniques later on with RNA sequencing and um, ribosomal protection. So I just picked a few examples out that I thought you might be interested in. There are, there are literally hundreds of these, if not thousands, different ways that um, genome sequencing can be valuable. Uh, I thought I'd start off with one which um, is sort of rooted both in diagnostics and therapies, so it's interesting from a biotech point of view um, for the pharmaceutical world. So we're talking here about um, cancer, as you will know, um, tumorigenesis, the form formation um, of tumours, arises because of a series of mutations that take place within the genome um, that lead to a loss of the normal controls that stop cells from dividing uncontrollably. Un uncontrollably. Um, and these can occur in lots of different genes. There are many genes which, when mutated, can give rise to a cancerous condition. Um, these include the genes called oncogenes, which you may be familiar with. And these are often genes which are involved in things like cell signaling um, or, or detecting cell-cell contact, that kind of stuff. And... Um, They've been known about for quite a long time. There's, there's ways and means of identifying these, um, quite laborious ones. So the question that people started to ask is, rather than just trying to identify each individual mutation, can we identify these mutations by sequencing the entire genome in a tumour? Um, and this was first done back in 2008, so relatively recently. And in this particular case, um, it was an acute myeloid leukaemia genome, so they took someone... Um, who was suffering from this particular condition uh, and compared the sequence of the DNA from some cancerous cells to some DNA to, to the DNA from cells that, that weren't cancerous from the same person. So you're looking for mutations within an individual here. And this was done using Illumina, um, which was the best thing available at the time. And the hypothesis was that by comparing the, um, the wild-type sequence and the sequence from the cancer cells, uh, they would be able to detect mutations that were unique to the cancer cells and that some of those, at least, should be implicated in the formation of uh, the cancerous state. Now, they had a reference human genome, and when they compared um, the genome of this person to that reference genome, they found something like 2.5 million SNPs. The SNP is a single nucleotide polymorphism, so a single, a single base pair change. And this is around about typical um, remember, the, the human genome is, is billions of bases longs, long, um, and this is just normal variation. If we looked at any of our genomes, they'd be different, and mostly there'd be single base pair changes at different positions. Um, and between any two of us, there, there would be some millions of changes because of you know, our different ancestry. Um, so most of this represented 99%, uh, sorry, most of this represented normal variation that's just found between people, nothing to do with the cancer at all. And um, they found all sorts of different mutations. Um, the mutations could be in non-coding regions, so parts of the genome that weren't going to give rise to a protein. Uh, this might be introns inside genes. There might be stretches of DNA that, that weren't transcribed at all. And they also found them uh, in coding regions. Um, and mutations in coding regions, as, as you may recall, from your undergraduate courses can be um, synonymous or non-synonymous. Synonymous means it doesn't cause a change in the amino acid. Um, non-synonymous means it does cause a change in the amino acid. And they also found um, what are loosely called indels, small insertions or small deletions that were different between the, cancer, the, the, um, the genome, the, the wild-type genome, and the um, human reference genome at the time. So they had to do a huge amount of analysis to try to filter out all the stuff that was 
um, the same and look for mutations that were apparently present only in the tumor genome and were only non-synonymous. So it looked as though they were causing a change in the amino acid sequence. And they did a lot of resequencing. This is fairly in the early days of Illumina when the, the base calling wasn't so good. So they would go back into the genome and resequence bits using the Sanger method to check it was okay. And after doing this, they found um, just 10 differences. So they, that 2.5 million differences between the reference genome and this person's genome, only 10 of those were different between the tumor genome and the non-tumor genome. And um, they must have been pretty relieved when they discovered that two of them were already known to be common in acute myeloid leukemia. In other words, they went through this long sequencing process and rediscovered a couple of the genes that people already knew about. So that was kind of a relief, um, and it was an indication that the process had worked. And of the other eight, four of them had been implicated in previous cancers, but not in acute myeloid leukemia. So they'd been missed, presumably, in the previous screens that had taken place. Um, and this was the first time someone was able to show those particular mutations might have a role in AML as well. Um, the other four were in novel genes that hadn't previously um, been implicated in cancer at all. And the question then becomes, are these cancer-causing genes or are they just random changes that happen to have taken place in the tumor cell line? So just by doing that one study, that comparison of two sets of genome data from the same individual, they probably picked up several new genes um, that were, could be implicated in this particular kind of cancer. Now, um, that's very powerful, and that, that paper made a big splash at the time. Um, but again, it's quite limited. Uh, it only looks at one particular person. Um, even if you look at the same sort of cancer from many different people, they, they can vary a great deal. You know, cancer um, is an incredibly complicated condition, and people who present with the same condition will, will not necessarily have the same mutations. And of course, um, even a single tumor within a person will itself evolve and change over time, particularly, as again we'll see in just a moment, if it's under selective pressure. For example, if you treated it with a, um, a therapeutic agent, which is designed to kill the cancer cells, you're selecting for mutations in the cancer cells that are resistant to that agent. So the, the tumour itself will change as time goes by. So this was around about the time that people were beginning to scale up genome sequencing in a very serious way and look at larger numbers. So within um, a fairly short space of time, so this is up to 2012, um, there have been studies where lots of different tumours have been compared in a single study. So um, one study looked at 38 different um, myelomas, another one looked at seven prostate tumours, another one looked at 46 breast cancer tumours. So these are now bigger experiments looking at larger populations, looking for mutations that may be common between different genotypes. And um, this is uh, one of the more recent papers, this is from about a year ago now, uh, and this is looking at 560 individual cancer uh, tumours taken from breast cancer patients all being sequenced completely and then um, being examined to see whether or not there are particular mutations that can be um, associated with the tumour or associated with different stages of the tumour, which is where this technique really does start to become very powerful indeed. So um, what sort of use can you put this information to? Well, it can be quite useful um, if you're trying to work out at what point in tumour progression somebody is at because you can get this information relatively quickly. And um, it, this is an important thing for doctors to know, because they need to know if somebody presents um, with a tumour, is this uh, you know, stage one, which is relatively benign, all the way to stage four, which is, is really pretty serious. Because knowing what stage the tumour is at will have an influence on the kind of treatment they're going to um, diagnose. Is it going to be sort of fairly mild, a, a, a simple chemotherapy treatment? Is it going to be a radical surgery? Um, or is it going to be regarded as incurable, in which case it's just palliative care. And it has always been the case that lots of different things have been looked at to try to get this information. And having genome sequence information is just one more um, set of information you can use. So this is an example from the paper published, I think, in about 2010, just illustrating the point that there's now lots of different bits of information that you can integrate. Um, CNV refers to copy number, copy number variation, so different numbers um, of bits of DNA, mutation calls from whole genome sequencing, uh, gene expression, so looking at patterns of gene expression within the tumour cells, we'll see later on how that can be done, translocation status, so this is where bits of chromosomes have moved to, to other 
chromosomes, quite common in certain kinds of tumours. And then putting all this together, um, they found you could basically, for this particular form of tumour, talk about these different um, categories, um, A, B, and C. And what's really important here is that, as you can see, the prognosis for these different categories is rather different. So if you present with a type C, uh, you're, on average you're going to survive another three years. Whereas if you present with um, type A here, the prognosis is pretty good. So this kind of information gives you a fairly quick window into um, the, the state of the condition that you're trying to treat, and that's really going to help you, hopefully, to decide what kind of therapies to have. So we're moving towards a kind of personalised medicine here. So not just saying this person's got this kind of cancer, but they've got this genome sequence, this gene expression, and so forth. Therefore, the most useful form of treatment is going to be whatever the doctor decides. The other thing, of course, that this is potentially very useful for is identifying new targets. So by looking for genes which are commonly mutated and then studying the, the proteins that those genes encode, those are potential targets for anti-cancer drugs. If this gene has, for example, um, become overexpressed in cell types where it's normally not expressed and you're looking for ways of turning that gene off, well, now you know what the gene is and you can begin to look at the particular protein concerned. We'll have a look at that in an... Um, one of the later modules. Just to give you one example quickly, um, there's quite a common um, oncogene called the BRAF gene, um, proto-oncogene, and it's really quite common in certain kinds of um, tumours, including myelomas. So a lot of people carry mutations in BRAF. And uh, there's a particular set of small molecules which inhibit some of the mutated forms of the BRAF. Not all of them, but some of them. And um, these inhibitors are quite specific, and you can actually halt tumour progression and even um, reverse tumour progression by treating with these sorts of agents. Now, they are only indicated if you've got particular mutations in that gene. If you have other kinds of mutations, they're, they're, they're no good. They don't act against those mutations. So only patients with those particular mutations are going to benefit by being treated with those compounds. So this is an example where... Sequencing, you can very, very quickly identify who those patients are and prescribe the appropriate therapy. Um, these therapies are very expensive, so you don't have to waste a lot of money um, applying them to patients for whom they won't do any good at all. As I said before, the great sort of hope of the sequences is eventually this sort of process will be so comprehensive that everyone will have their own kind of personalised healthcare designed completely around their genome sequence. I think we're a long, long way from that, and I'm not sure if we'll ever really get there, but there are some examples where you can specifically do that already. It's a complicated story. Um, you can, when people have done this sort of study, they've shown that a lot of tumours that look very similar actually carry rather different mutations, um, and there is certainly um, no one cancer gene that you can implicate in any one particular kind of cancer. It's much more complicated than that. And what's probably necessary is to step back from the individual genes, look at pathways, as we discussed before, um, and look at gene families which are regulated in the same way, and then maybe look at altering the regulation of those gene families rather than inhibiting particular proteins. There's also this problem that I just mentioned, um, which is that cancer cells change over time. So natural selection works very well inside your body, as it does everywhere else. This is true for cancer cells. Um, it's also very true for bacteria evolving antibiotic resistance. Same sort of problem. Uh, this is a timeline here, moving from left to right, going through time. So we start off with healthy tissue. At some point, um, maybe by random chance, maybe by exposure to some kind of environmental carcinogen, uh, mutations accumulate, which lead to a cancerous or precancerous state. If we're lucky, we pick these up, and the doctor um, prescribes for us some fairly benign form of anti-cancer therapy, and that's great. Um, that population of cells starts to get smaller. Um, but that's a very strong selection for mutations that don't, aren't affected by that treatment. And, of course, once the mutation has taken place to make them immune to that treatment, that's then going to start to spread again. So then you've got a secondary mutation here and growth of the cells. And in this case... The thing that is, generally speaking, pretty close to the kiss of death, um, a mutation that enables the cancer cells to begin to spread or metastasize and take up residence in different organs of the body, um, and that's when you have secondaries, and, and that's when cancer is really very serious. Um, at this point, generally speaking, it, it's, it's pretty hard to treat, 
Um, although the BRAF inhibitor I mentioned earlier on could be used in the short term successfully to treat this, not in the long term, because again, mutations will arise. Um, but even a few years of extra life it is, is well worth having um, if you're given the alternative of that or death. So cancer is a complicated process, but we can track this now as it takes place in the tumours by resequencing the genome from the same tumour. So we can sequence um, someone who's, who's got a cancerous condition, take biopsies from the tumour and sequence the genome in that and watch new mutations as they appear over time and track that development process. So um, there's a huge number of cancer projects now running. Um, this is a, a screen grab which I just got just before this lecture from a thing called the International Cancer Genome Consortium. This is only a tiny subset of the projects that are running. There's um, 89 projects altogether listed here. Um, and what you'll see is you know, um, so blood cancer being studied in the States, China, South Korea, um, and elsewhere. Uh, and this list goes on and on and on. Um, and these are all places where different groups of researchers have agreed to um, look at particular tumour types, pull their data uh, into large data sets to try to um, identify causative agents um, and particularly mutations that are associated with those cancers. Um, and this is a really pretty fast-moving field. Um, and data generation is not a limiting factor. The thing that takes time is data analysis, because look at all this data is, is quite a big call. Okay, though. So I'm going to say something briefly about epidemiology, then we'll take a break and I'll say a bit more about epidemiology. So ep epidemiology is um, studying patterns of disease in large populations, and in this particular case, the spread of infection. So if we have um, an epidemic, for example, um, epidemiologists are interested in where did it start, how did it spread, if it died out, why did it die out, what were the factors that influenced how this condition passed through the population um, and eventually, hopefully, died away. And whole genome sequencing of bacteria and viruses provides us with a very, very quick and easy way of, of tracking this. And the idea is very simple, which is that as um, bacterial viruses grow and spread, they will acquire mutations. Some of those may be selected for, but some of them may just be random. You know, random mutations are happening all the time. And so by looking at lots of different isolates from different places or from different times, we can see how these mutations appear and use them to reconstruct a map or a tree of how these things, how, how these diseases spread. So here's a really very, very simple um, example of that. Let's imagine we've got an infection uh, that started somewhere and it, it spread to, to Europe and to the States. And at this point, these bacteria are genetically identical. But then, by some random process, um, the bacteria in, in, in Europe, you know, one of them acquires a mutation, and that gives it uh, its characteristic A, and one of the ones in the States acquires a characteristic B. Now, all the descendants from the ones with A will have that A mutation in, and all the descendants of the ones with B will have the B mutation in. So what we know is if we sequence something down here, you know, some generations further on, and it's got the B mutation in, we can trace it back. It, it, it happened after the thing had separated and gone to the States. So you don't get B in the European lineage, only in the American lineage. Now that's about as simple as it can get. Of course, it's way more complicated because people travel backwards and forwards. Lots of mutations happen. You can occasionally have back mutation. Um, but there are ways of, of tracking and examining all these things. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples of where that's been done. So this is a paper that came out in, came out in um, Nature fairly recently. It's mostly from um, the big sequencing centre in Cambridge, which is called the Sanger Centre, um, named after Fred Sanger, of course. And this is looking at um, cholera. So cholera is a um, not uncommon disease. Um, it can be fatal. Uh, it's extremely infectious. It's spread by basically by dirty water. Um, there's several million cases every year. It's particularly common after natural disasters. So when there's been a flood or an earthquake or a um, hurricane, something like that, and normal sources of clean water are not available, um, what tends to happen is drinking water gets um, contaminated by human waste. And that's a recipe for, for cholera being spread quite readily. And um, we know of seven global pandemics. So this is cases where a cholera strain has arisen that's quite virulent, has spread around the whole planet, and then eventually died out. Uh, we're in the seventh at the moment, most people reckon. So there, there is a cholera pandemic going on at the moment. 
It's a particular strain called Altor, um, and this dates back to around about the early 60s. Um, so, luckily for us, uh, microbiologists um, have been very assiduously um, isolating the organism that causes this. It's a bacterium called Vibrio cholerae um, from people suffering from cholera, putting them into strain collections, putting them into their freezers, uh, and so people could then go back to those strain collections, and, and as long as the documentation was accurate, they could say, can we sequence the genome from the outbreak that occurred in your country in 1968 or 1973 or whenever it was? And then by doing a much, much more complicated process than the one that I showed you, but you get the general idea, link these to try to track them to see where those infections had come from and how they'd spread. And um, it's a complicated process, but they looked at 156 um, different isolates of the organism from all over the world, sequenced their complete genomes, looked at the mutations that had occurred. And we're able to use this to reconstruct um, a map that shows the spread of these different isolates um, across the globe. Now, the first thing that you'll notice from this is they all started off in pretty much the same place. So every single um, wave of infection in the current cholera pandemic, the seventh pandemic, has started off in the Bay of Bengal. Um, and this is not surprising. Um, the Bay of Bengal essentially gets most of the affluent from, from Bangladesh and from a large part of India. Uh, there's a significant problem there with flooding most years when the monsoons come. Um, a lot of the land around there is very low-lying. Sanitation is extremely poor, um, so a lot of waste gets washed into the Bay of Bengal. It's very warm, perfect breeding ground for cholera bacteria. And every single um, wave could be traced back to here. But what you can see is how these things spread. So there's a, um, an outbreak uh, in Ethiopia in 1973 that had arisen from there. Uh, that outbreak spread to West Africa. That then spread to South America. And that particular one actually went right the way around the world and reinfected people back in Bangladesh in the 80s. So that's a bacterial strain or a series of descendants of the bacterial strain that have completely circumnavigated the globe and finished back in the place where they started from. This transmission, of course, is massively facilitated by modern travel. We all get on planes, we all fly around the world, um, we pick up things in one country, we excrete them in a different country, um, and this is how infections get spread very rapidly. And you can see other examples here of infections that have progressed as far as um, the Caribbean, but not gotten any, got any further so far. Some which got to Europe haven't gotten any further. Most of the ones that get to Europe tend to be contained because sanitation and medicine's better. Um, but you get an idea here from, of how you can track where these infections come from. Now, that's kind of interesting, um, but it becomes very important uh, in cases like this. I don't know if you remember the big earthquake in um, Haiti back in, uh, when was it? Um, 2008. Yes, thanks. Um, and the earthquake killed quite a few people, but a lot more people died from the cholera outbreak that happened um, after the earthquake. And embarrassingly, it turned out that this cholera outbreak had come from United Nations uh, health workers who'd gone to Haiti to try and help the population and had set up a camp fairly close to a river that actually flowed into Port-au-Prince, which is the capital of the country, um, and had been shedding cholera uh, in their waste, which had then gone on to infect the people who were in um, Port-au-Prince. So there were thousands of deaths from this coming from the people who had actually gone there to help in the first place. Now, um, this is you know, very unfortunate, obviously, um, and wasn't anyone's fault in particular, because the people that were shedding the um, bacterium were pretty much resistant to it, so weren't aware that they were carrying it. Uh, but the point is, this then becomes very important legally, because then there's an issue of who's legally responsible for the outbreak. Um, and uh, there are court cases um, still working their way through international courts about this. So 8,000 people died in that outbreak, um, which was entirely preventable had the sanitation been better. Um, and the DNA evidence is absolutely crucial here because one of the questions is, where did the outbreak come from? And the DNA evidence is pretty unambiguous that it came from um, some Nepalese workers who've come in working for the United Nations. So one of the things about DNA evidence is that um, it's not always as unambiguous as that. It can be very complicated to interpret. Uh, but when you're comparing genome sequences and you can show that an outbreak in Haiti is pretty much identical to one in Nepal, but very different from other ones in, say, Cuba and Central America, you can be fairly certain that's where the bacterium came from. <laughs> 
Okay, well, I think we'll take a break at this point because um, the clock has just chimed. Um, so five minutes uh, just to relax a bit and then we'll pick up um, some more about epidemiology.